Hi, I'm Justin with Roland Professional AV, and welcome to this complete tutorial for Roland's VR120HD Direct Streaming AV Mixer. The VR120HD has six SDI and six HDMI inputs, all active at the same time and assignable to the input buttons and composition layers. There are also three SDI and three HDMI outputs, as well as LAN and USB streaming outputs. For audio, there are six XLR TRS combo inputs, and the faders can be assigned to any analog or digital source in the 42 channel audio mixer. The VR120 HD is an all-in-one solution that's loaded with features, so I'll walk you through everything that this switcher can do. But if you only need help with a particular feature or the firmware update, please use the chapters in the video description to jump to that section. This tutorial features firmware version 1.05. Please note that menu layouts and features may change with future updates. Starting with the top panel, there is a single row of buttons to select inputs, recall scene memories, and more. The eight buttons control the eight assigned inputs on the multi-view screen. The currently selected input is lit red and appears in the program window on the multi-view. This is what your audience sees as your main video output. Above that are the mode buttons to change what the input buttons do. You can use them to select the aux video output source, recall a scene memory, or run a macro. The setup button opens a menu with quick access to settings for the currently selected mode. Before we go further, note that there are two types of menus used to adjust settings. There is the standard menu, which takes up the left half of the LCD screen and contains nearly every setting. And there are the setup menus, which take up the bottom half or the entire LCD screen and function as more of a graphical interface for both controlling features and adjusting settings. You can access setup menus by pressing the various setup buttons on the top panel or by selecting jump to setup from the main menu. To the right of that are controls for transitions and panel operation, which you use to either cut, mix dissolve, or wipe from one input to another, as well as two split screen modes and operating the sequencer. Above that are controls for the four picture-in-picture -picture windows and two downstream keyers for graphics, as well as the customizable user buttons, which give you easy access to additional features. The audio mixer on the left has controls for the analog inputs, which you can customize to include digital sources. For example, if you want to use a mixer channel to control HDMI input 2's audio, you can quickly reassign it in the setup menu. Above the mixer are the level knobs for the audio output buses, four audio effects which can be customized, and eight pads to play audio and sound effects that you import. To the right of that is an LCD screen multi-view and the menu controls. The monitor button lets you change what you see on the LCD screen. The various monitor modes can also be assigned to video outputs, which we will cover later. Finally, the output fade button by default transitions the video to solid black or white and fades out the audio as well. You can customize this in the system menu if you want to keep the audio or fade to the aux video bus. On the back, from right to left, are six SDI and six HDMI inputs. While you can only assign eight total inputs and still images to the input buttons and display them on the multi-view, all 12 inputs are active. To view all 12 inputs, press the input view button or assign the input view to a video output. You can also assign inputs and still images to the picture-in-picture -picture and downstream key composition layers, even if they're not assigned to the input buttons. All HDMI inputs have scalers, which are flexible with older equipment that does not output HD video. Another advantage to scalers is they resize and reposition the source, which can be helpful if you want to hide the taskbar from a laptop, for example. The three SDI, three HDMI, and LAN and USB streaming outputs can be customized to output program, aux, multi-view, and more, giving you flexibility and reducing the need for signal converters, as multiple outputs can share the same video bus. Note that when you open the menu, it will appear only on the LCD screen. Next to the USB streaming output is the LAN port for streaming directly without a computer, as well as connecting to compatible PTZ cameras and third-party control systems. Along the top are six XLR TRS combo inputs with microphone and line inputs. There are two additional stereo RCA line inputs, and although all video and streaming outputs have embedded audio, there are also XLR and RCA outputs for connecting speakers and recorders. Next to the SDI outputs are the reference input and output. This is for advanced users that need to synchronize their VR120 HD using Genlock. You can set the reference to the internal clock, an external generator, or a signal connected to one of the SDI inputs. 
The quarter inch inputs are not for audio. They're actually for foot switch control. If you connect a compatible Boss foot switch, you can set it up to control the VR120 HD. The tally port is for connecting a compatible tally light system, as well as eight general purpose inputs for customized control. There is also an RS-232 port for connecting to third-party control systems if you do not plan to use the LAN port for that. The power supply is the PSB14U. If you need a replacement, please contact your dealer or visit roland.com backstage and submit a parts request. And on the front side panel, the USB host and SD card ports are used to import still images and video clips, as well as back up your settings. The USB host port is also used for firmware updates. And there's both an eighth inch and quarter inch output for headphones with a single volume knob. The VR120 HD has two different types of menus. The standard menu is great for adjusting most settings and takes up the left half of the LCD screen with an option in the system menu to move it to the right side. To open the main menu, press the menu button and use the value knob to highlight a submenu and push the knob to enter it. You can also tap it with your finger. Once you get to a setting you want to adjust, push the knob to edit the value. If the setting is a slider or list, rotate the value knob to adjust it and push the knob again to confirm your selection. A trick to adjust slider settings faster is to hold down the knob while twisting it. If using the touchscreen, in addition to tapping the choose settings, you can move sliders simply with your finger. If you need to make a small adjustment, tap the minus or plus icons next to the slider. And pressing the exit button will go up one menu level while pressing the menu button again will exit it completely. The setup menus are more of a graphical interface for features like the audio mixer, macros, PTZ control, and more. Not all features have a dedicated button to access their setup menu, but you can access them by selecting jump to setup from the main menu. If there is a feature that you use a lot, you can assign it to a user button to quickly access it. Just press the user setup button and change the category setting to the feature you want to use. The setup menus take up either the entire LCD screen or the bottom half, but you can tap the arrow icon to move it to the top half if needed. Note that tapping outside the menus will not exit them, and you can still select inputs while the menus are open. You need to instead use the buttons along the top of the menu, the return arrow to go up one level, and the X inside a circle to exit the menu. When you connect video sources to the VR120 HD's inputs, they will quickly appear if assigned to the multi-view. Because they don't have scalers, all SDI inputs need to have the same resolution as the system format setting in the system menu. By default, this is 1080p resolution. That means your sources can be either 1080i or 1080p. If your source is 480p or 720p, you can use the HDMI inputs and the scaler will resize it to 1080p. If most of your sources are 720p, change the system format on the VR120 HD to 720p. The VR120 HD will automatically convert frame rates, so your sources can be a mix of anything between 23.98 and 60 Hz. The default output frame rate is 59.94 Hz or 50 Hz, depending on your country's video standard. Note that all SDI and HDMI outputs match the system format and frame rate settings, with the option to choose between 1080i and 1080p for each output individually when the system format is also 1080. The LAN and USB streaming outputs can be set to 1080p or 720p, with the option to cut the frame rate in half if the system frame rate is higher than 30 Hz. In the Video Assign menu, you can customize the video inputs and outputs. Inputs 1 through 8 are the video switcher channels, and can be any video input or still image, making it fully customizable. You can also quickly change these by pressing the Setup button in Input Select mode, which is helpful during production. For each of the eight video outputs, you can assign them to any of seven buses, and as we mentioned earlier, more than one output can be assigned to the same bus. Program and subprogram are what your audience sees. It is the selected input plus transitions and composition layers. The AUX bus is independently switchable from program. This can be helpful if you want to send a PowerPoint to in-house displays or set up a confidence monitor on stage for a presenter. You can customize which composition layers are visible on Program, Subprogram, and Aux using the layer submenus. This is helpful if you want Subprogram to be a clean version of Program without any overlays, or if you have a hybrid event with different composition layer needs for the in-house and live stream feeds. Changing the output assignments is necessary to set up the Aux video output. For example, 
you have Camera One on program assigned to the USB streaming output for your live stream, and you have a PowerPoint as the aux assigned to an SDI output for an in-house projector because the audience does not need to see the cameras on the projector. You can also assign any of three multi-view types to a video output. There's the standard multi-view, which is what you see on the LCD screen, as well as input view, which displays all SDI and HDMI inputs, and still view for all of your still images. In the video input menu, you can adjust each of the SDI and HDMI inputs. You can also see the input status for each input on the list to help troubleshoot a connection and see what its resolution and frame rate is. There's also individual input status screens with more information. Below that are settings to flip the image and adjust how it looks. The HDMI inputs have additional settings, including EDID, which can be helpful for troubleshooting. Otherwise, leave it at its default internal setting. The scaler adjusts the size and position of the video source. This can be helpful with computers if you want to crop out a taskbar or dock. And below that are color correction settings. It's recommended to first adjust brightness, contrast, and saturation on the sources themselves, especially if it's a camera, before making any adjustments in the video input menu. In the video output menu, color space and signal type can be adjusted when troubleshooting compatibility issues with other equipment. Otherwise, use the default settings. Below that are settings to adjust how the output looks, as well as to enable record control over HDMI with compatible Atomos recorders. The USB output menu gives you the status of the connection for troubleshooting. It should say connected 3.0 for HD quality video. You can then connect it to any software that supports USB video and audio, like Roland Livestreamer, Roland Live Recorder, OBS Studio, Zoom, Teams, and more. You can also adjust the output format setting. If your connection is unstable, change the setting from YUI2 to YUI2 in Motion JPEG. Note that the setting with Motion JPEG may create pixelated areas in your video image when using conferencing software like Zoom or Teams. In that case, it's recommended to use the YUI2 setting. If you have any issues with your USB video connection, please visit our knowledge base for a list of compatible USB cables. There's a link in the description of this video. The reason for this is that not all USB-C cables support super speed data transfer. Some are designed only for charging devices. In the audio menus, you can mix and process audio from the analog inputs, each video input, as well as the USB streaming port and wirelessly with Bluetooth. Each source can be processed with effects like equalization and compression. Audio in one through six have settings for phantom power if you're using condenser microphones or stereo link if you're using a pair as line inputs. This setting pans these inputs all the way to the left and right and gives you control of both inputs using only one fader. Input level adjusts the source in the audio mix. You first want to set the level using the gain knob or analog gain setting for that audio source. It's not recommended to use digital gain to boost the low signal as that can add noise. Digital gain is typically used to fine tune the audio level if the equalizer and compressor change the level noticeably. And if you're not using an SDI or HDMI source's audio, it's a good idea to mute that source. Press the audio level button to quickly access the mute buttons on one screen. Also, if your SDI or HDMI source has more than two audio channels, you can select a different pair of channels to mix. Most sources have audio only on channels one and two, but this feature can come in handy and save you from having to use a de-embedder box. Mono is helpful if an audio source is only on the left or right side when listening on headphones and you want to center it. And if you solo one or more sources, those are the only sources you will hear on headphones, so make sure to turn solo off when you're done using it. Effect presets are a great starting point with equalization and compression for different applications. And you can use delay to get individual sources in sync with the video. If you prefer a graphical layout to adjust audio, press the setup button for a channel on the audio mixer, and you can edit the settings for the assigned source. Every audio input source has a noise gate, compressor, and equalizer. Audio inputs one through six also have a de and audio inputs one and two add a voice changer, echo canceller, and anti-feedback. The noise gate mutes the audio when it falls below the threshold level. Increasing the release time can make this effect sound more natural, but setting it too high can make ambient noise noticeable. The compressor lowers the level of audio above the threshold level. The ratio determines the amount of reduction, which can function as a limiter when turned all the way up, which is helpful for loud sources. The attack and release times are how long it takes the compressor to turn on and off once it crosses the threshold. Check the presets for ideas on which settings to use. Because the compressor lowers the levels of the source audio at times, you can also manually apply gain. 
The de-esser is like a specialized compressor, designed to reduce sibilance, S sounds in your mix that can be distracting for viewers. The high pass filter and equalizer adjust the levels of low, mid, and high frequencies. Use the high pass filter with voices that have a lot of low end, especially when using a dynamic microphone. You can drag the three dots to adjust the equalizer bands or use the settings above them. For the mid band, you can also adjust its Q to make it wider or narrower. While the presets will work well for most applications, it's important to use your ears when adjusting these settings, as you will likely need to adjust the threshold settings based on the audio source. If you adjust the audio effects and it sounds worse than before, load the default effect preset for that source, as incorrect settings can add noise and distortion to your audio mix. The audio output menu has settings for three different audio mixes. Main output is your main mix. It has a compressor limiter, which can prevent loud audio from distorting, output delay for synchronizing audio to video, reverb, which is useful for music performances, as well as two types of equalizers for the entire mix. The aux mixes, which can either be linked or separate from the aux video output, also have these settings. Main mix also has some useful tools on the third page. Loudness auto gain control for smoothing out mix levels and adaptive noise reduction to intelligently remove noise from a room. The audio follow menu is a helpful tool. Here, you can enable this for each individual source. The basic idea is, if you can see it, you can hear it. When a video source appears on program, the source's embedded audio is heard until you no longer see it on program. You can also link the analog, USB, Bluetooth, and audio player sources to an input on the video switcher. And the audio auto mixing menu gives you control over which audio sources are given priority by adjusting the weight setting. The higher the percentage, the more prominent the source is in the automated mix. You can also disable auto mixing on individual sources. The audio player has eight pads you can use to play clips. Press the setup button to access the player setup. The mixer input setup is a shortcut to the audio player's mixer settings. The player setup shows you the default sound effects and music files along with their properties. Tap a pad icon on the screen to adjust its settings. You can import a new sound effect from an SD card or USB flash drive, name it, adjust the level and fade times, and choose whether it repeats or plays once. There are also four pad modes. Latch, pressing a pad starts the file and pressing again stops it. Pause is similar, except that when you start it again, it resumes at the point you stopped. Replay restarts playback each time you press the pad. And momentary stops as soon as you let go of the pad. The three playing modes are helpful for managing playback. BGM mode is for music, so that only one song will play at a time. This is helpful if you have multiple music cues and you want a clean transition between songs. Just make sure to set up your fade times if you want to crossfade the music. SE mode is for sound effects, allowing you to have multiple pads playing at the same time. And solo mode is for audio files where you want all other pads to stop playing when you start it. Now that we covered video and audio setup, let's move on to switching inputs. By default, if you press one of the input buttons, it will switch to it using the currently selected panel operation setting. If it's cut, the transition will happen instantly. If it's auto, the transition is either a mix dissolve or wipe, depending on the transition setting. If you want to access all video inputs without assigning them to input buttons, press the input view button and tap the source you want to switch to. You can also do this with still images. If you prefer to preview your next input before the transition, Open the system menu and change the panel operation setting from dissolve to program preset. In this mode, pressing an input button sends that source in preview and the button turns green. To complete the transition, if you press auto, it will apply a mix or wipe transition, whichever is selected. Press cut and program will swap with preview. For this section, I will briefly change this window to aux output. To switch the aux video source, make sure the mode button is set to aux and press an input button to change it. Note that the aux video output is cut switching only, does not support mix dissolves or wipes, but it does support composition layers. You can enable picture-in-picture -picture and downstream key layers for the aux output in the video assigned menu. 
This can be helpful if you want to add a logo to both the program and aux outputs. If you want the aux output to be an identical copy of program at certain times, open the input setup menu and change the aux linked program setting to manual link. Now your aux video output is a copy of program, including all transitions and composition layers enabled for program. Pressing any aux source button will make it an independent aux output again, and when you press the currently selected aux source button, it will be linked again. The auto switching menu lets you automatically switch between inputs in a variety of ways. It can be as simple as custom timings or to a music source's tempo. You can also use it to switch between preset memory scenes. You can have it switch in order or at random, and if you want to remove an input from auto switching, turn down its timing until it is off. You can also use the scan target setting to have auto switching change a picture in picture source instead of the background program source. But the most versatile mode is video follows audio where any audio source can control a video input button. Scroll to the audio source you want to assign, select off, and then choose the input. Note that you cannot choose the actual video source. It controls the actual button in the video switcher section. The threshold is the audio level the source has to go over to trigger the switching, and there are three additional settings at the end. You can use the audio mix target and audio silent target if you want your entire mix to control different inputs. For example, if you want to transition to your wide shot when no one is talking, you can set up the audio silent target to do that. And the audio redetection time is how long it takes before it is ready to detect and switch again. Picture in Picture is a window on top of your full screen background video source. With the VR120 HD, they can be fully resized and cropped, and can even be used with a green screen or a graphic overlay. To start, I will press the preview button for Picture in Picture 1. Instead of using the menu, I can press the setup button, and you will see an input button turns yellow for the current source, and you can change it by pressing a different input button. I can also adjust the size, shape, and position using the settings on the screen. The four Picture in Picture layers have a fixed order. One is on the bottom and four is on the top. If you want to rearrange them by layers, tap the copy button in the setup menu and choose an option. You can also copy settings from another layer to the one you're editing, which is helpful if you want to have the same size and shape for multiple layers. Also, if you want to make sure you are about to edit the correct picture in picture layer, you can press and hold its preview or program button to spot it, which only shows that layer on the respective output. Additional settings exclusive to the picture-in-picture -picture menu include cropping the window, in case I want a vertical rectangle, or the green screen doesn't fit the entire camera shot. I can also customize the border around the window. If you want to use the picture-in-picture -picture for a green screen or graphic overlay, change the picture-in-picture -picture type to chroma key. We will cover keying in detail with the downstream keyer. When you're ready to bring the picture-in-picture -picture to program, press its program button. You can adjust the length of the mix transition using the time setting. You may have noticed that the background source and picture-in-picture -picture window are switched independently. If you want to link them together so that your transitions will swap everything in preview with everything in program, turn on effects transition sync in the system menu. If you only want to use this feature at certain times, you can reassign one of the user buttons to turn it on and off. There's also a split screen mode, which you can enable by pressing either of the split buttons and press the setup button to choose sources and adjust the split position. Note that the split mode will appear in both program and preview as a cut transition. You cannot use a mix or wipe transition with it. If you want to fade to a split, set up two picture in picture windows to each take up a half of the screen and switch to them using a scene memory or macro, both of which we will cover later. Next is the DSK or downstream keyer, which is used primarily to display graphics like someone's name, a logo, or any image where you want the background to be transparent and overlay it on top of your program video. Note that the two downstream keyer layers are always on top of your picture-in-picture -picture layers and your program source. If you want to rearrange them by layers, tap the copy button in the setup menu and choose an option. In the downstream keyer menu, the default setting is self key. This means that you can use a luma key, which removes white or black, or chroma key, which removes a color. The default source for DSK1 is a still image containing a corner logo that says live. Turn the level and gain settings all the way down and you will see that the logo has a black background, which disappears when I turn up the level. For most graphics, start with increasing level until the target color disappears 
and then fine tune with gain if needed. I will change this to an input with a slideshow of graphics I created. Here, you can see a limitation of Luma Key. If I have a black background and black text, both are removed by the key effect. To get around this, I created graphics with green backgrounds because chroma key can be used with more than just green screens. Change the downstream keyer type to chroma. Note how nothing is happening when I adjust the settings. I need to change the color setting in the chroma tab from blue to green. Now I'm getting a good key when I adjust the level. If you're not getting good results, you can better match the key color using the sampling marker. This setting only appears in chroma mode. Tap sampling marker mode and a small cross will appear on the screen. Tap an area of the image with the color you want to remove, followed by tapping execute. Note how the hue and saturation settings have changed. This feature is especially important when setting up a green screen, saving you time with finding the best hue and saturation settings. I mentioned earlier that the picture-in-picture -picture windows are also capable of Luma and Chroma Key. A great example of this is if you want to place a transparent graphic in the corner or resize it. Another is if you want a green screen camera shot of yourself in the corner while you present full screen content. And if your green screen does not fill the entire camera image, you can crop the picture in picture window and create a clean overlay. There are two additional keyer types available only with the downstream keyer. Note that they do not use the level or gain settings to adjust them. The first is alpha key mode. This will overlay a PNG format still image with alpha channel, which has the transparency built into the file. No other still image formats are supported with this mode. For this section, I already imported a PNG format still image. We will cover importing still images in the next section. Remember earlier how Luma Key was removing the text along with the background? With Alpha Channel, the image file has the transparency figured out beforehand, giving you a cleaner looking key without any color restrictions. To create compatible images, you'll need image editing software like Photoshop to create them. The second is External Key. This is an advanced feature that requires compatible graphic software and two video inputs on the VR120 HD. Your graphic software may call it external key, alpha key, or key and fill. The computer will output two video signals of the same graphic, the actual graphic as you see it on the computer screen, and a black and white silhouette of that same graphic. On the VR120 HD, the key source is that silhouette, and the fill source is the actual graphic. We use two still images for this demo, but alpha key mode is recommended for stills as it only requires one image file. No additional adjustments are needed. The silhouette acts as the alpha channel, telling the keyer what to remove. This is the best way to key a sequence of complex graphics with detailed edges or animations with no color restrictions. The VR120 HD supports up to 16 still images stored internally. You can import still images from an SD card or USB flash drive using the still image menu, or you can capture a still image from a live video input using the capture image button and following the steps on the LCD screen. When you load a still image, you will see a list of files on the SD card or USB flash drive. To import correctly, first format it in the VR120 HD's SD card slash USB memory menu. A USB drive with 16 gigabytes or less is recommended. The image file needs to have a name of up to 64 letters and numbers without any spaces in the format added to the end, .bmp for bitmap, .jpg for jpeg, and .png for png files. The image's pixel dimensions also need to match the system format setting on the VR120 HD. That means if the VR120 HD is set to 1080p or 1080i, the image needs to be 1920 by 1080 pixels, and if 720p, 1280 by 720. Note that software like Photoshop refers to these numbers as an image's dimensions, whereas video products typically consider them as an image's resolution. In Photoshop, resolution is typically the number of pixels per inch if you were to print an image on paper. As you have seen throughout this tutorial, a still image can be assigned to a video input, a picture-in-picture -picture source, a downstream keyer source, or even an output fade source. And note that all input connectors and still images are active, so they do not need to be visible on the multi-view in order to use them with a picture-in-picture -picture or downstream keyer. The bottom half of the multi-view only shows the sources mapped to input buttons 1 through 8. If you do not need your still images after using the VR120 HD, you can disable Store to Internal Storage in the Still Image menu. In addition to importing an image, you can save an image you captured to a USB flash drive, as well as delete imported still images. Note the empty still image slots will not have an asterisk in the menu. The VR120 HD can also import and playback video files. You can use the Video Player menu to import and make adjustments, 
but I will instead select Jump to Setup and use that menu instead. Here you will see the playback controls. You can adjust the start and end times, as well as adjust the audio level and enable repeat. Tap the File Import button and choose a compatible video file from an SD card or USB flash drive. Before you play it, you need to assign the video player to an input button so that you can switch to it. Scene memories store and recall visual layouts and menu settings. Most of your settings are stored in the scene, so it's like a snapshot of your VR120 HD. One way to use this creatively is to create different picture-in-picture -picture layouts and switch between them with a single button press. To recall a scene, press the Scene Memory Mode button, and the eight input buttons below it will turn blue. If no scene is saved to any of those buttons, it will be unlit. Press any of the blue input buttons to recall that scene. Note that if you press an unlit scene button, it will load the default settings for the VR120 HD. But it's not the same as a factory reset, because only the menus enabled and load parameter are affected. To create or overwrite a scene, set up your program layout and configure your settings. Press and hold one of the eight input buttons until they flash, confirming the scene was written. You can also add dissolve transitions to scene recalls by using the fade time setting in the scene memory menu. When it's set to 0.0, .0 seconds, it'll cut instead of dissolving. If you set a fade time higher than that and then recall a scene, it will dissolve out the picture-in-picture -picture and downstream keyer layers, dissolve to the new scene's input, and dissolve the layers back in. You can also enable or disable which layers follow the fade time setting. Press the setup button to see what's on program in each scene. This only appears when displaying eight scenes. There's also a condensed view with 16 scenes. You can also use this menu to name your scenes. If you change the name of any inputs, the changes will appear on this screen. You can also save, load, and delete scenes here. In addition to that, because you can use up to 32 scenes, there's a button assigned submenu where you can choose which scenes are assigned to the eight input buttons. So when you create and edit them, they do not need to be laid out in order. And to prevent certain groups of settings from changing with scene recalls, you can use the load parameter settings located further down the menu. You will see that the audio settings are disabled by default. Note that when you store a scene, it still stores the settings turned off in load parameter. They just won't be recalled. Note that the following menus are not affected by scene recalls. Audio player, stream record, scene memory, macro, sequencer, still image, video player, freeze, auto switching, CTL EXP, RS-232 tally, network, camera control, SD card USB memory, and system. Macros are a list of commands that include switching between inputs, turning the downstream keyer on and off, audio adjustments, and much more. If you find yourself pressing several buttons to do a common task in your workflow, creating a macro will save you time and reduce mistakes. The VR120 HD can store up to 100 macros, and each macro can also recall scenes and other macros. Press the Macro Mode button, and the eight input buttons below it turn orange. If there isn't a macro in any of these slots, the button will be unlit. To run macros, Press an orange input button, or tap Execute in the Macro Setup menu, and select it from the list. Remember to wait for the macro to finish before starting another macro, or you may interrupt the current macro in progress. Next, press the Setup button, and tap Edit. There are 16 built-in macros, so I will select number 17. While I can manually add my steps to the macro, I can also tap the Record button to save time. As you press buttons and move knobs, you will see your actions appear on the Edit list. Note that knob values are not recorded until you stop moving it. You can delete steps from the list while recording, and once you tap Apply, they're saved to the macro. Each macro contains up to 10 steps and can take place either after or at the same time as the previous step. You can also copy and swap steps and name the macro. To test the macro while editing it, tap Preview to watch it and decide if adjustments are needed. After the preview is complete, your settings will revert to how they were before running the macro. In addition to that, because you can use up to 100 macros, there's an Assign menu where you can choose which macros are assigned to the eight input buttons. So when you create and edit them, they do not need to be laid out in order. The VR120 HD also has a sequencer mode, which lets you recall scenes, run macros, and even switch inputs from a list you set up beforehand. You can run the sequencer steps manually in order, or you can jump to a specific step, or you can automate the sequence to follow timings that you set. To enter the sequencer mode, simply press the sequencer user button. But before you start using it, tap the setup button 
to add steps to the list and move or copy steps within the existing list. It's currently at the start of the sequence, and we can press the auto button to manually advance through the sequence, starting with demo macro 1, followed by demo macro 2. Notice that when I get to step 2, the cut button lights up. This allows me to go back to the previous step. I can also jump to a step in the sequencer by tapping the step and then tapping jump. Note that if you use the cut button or the jump function, it will cut to the end of that step. No animation or transition will be visible. When you press auto again to go to the next step, transitions will resume appearing as you move through your sequence. The network settings help you connect to PTZ cameras on a local network and receive control commands from a third-party control system. You can also use RS-232 to receive control commands. When configuring the LAN settings for the first time, you need to create a four-character password in the menu. Next, you need to configure your IP address. If you want your network router to assign an IP address to the VR120HD, leave it on using DHCP. If you want to assign a static IP address, choose Manual and enter an IP address in the same range as your local network. If you want to use tethering with your phone, connect it to the USB host port and select Start Tethering. You can also use the priority setting to choose which connection is used first. With the default LAN setting, the phone would be the backup network. With everything configured, the VR120HD can now communicate with other devices on your local network. With a wired network connection or tethered mobile device, the VR120HD can stream directly to any platform that supports RTMP. When you set up a service in the stream menu, you can log directly into Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch using your account information, or set up a custom stream, which uses an RTMP URL and stream key from any platform. The Use Web App setting gives you a short URL to type into any web browser and enter your stream settings, saving you time. The video bitrate setting determines the quality of your live stream, and the VR120HD takes us a step further by using an adaptive bitrate, which automatically adjusts itself during your production. If your internet connection is suddenly slow, the VR120HD will temporarily reduce the bitrate to compensate, preventing the stream from pausing or skipping. Another way to conserve bandwidth is by adjusting the separate bitrate setting for audio. During your stream, if something unexpected happens that you don't want your audience to see, you can quickly display a safety still image. You can find it in the stream record category in the user setup menu. This is used in combination with the stream delay setting, giving you time to interrupt the stream with the safety still image. Once things are back to normal, you can resume your stream with the delay intact. Also, when you start the stream, a trick to automate your intro is to create a macro that will switch to a full screen graphic, play music, dissolve to your wide shot, stop the music, and fade in a DSK logo in the corner. You can also record with the VR120HD directly to an SD card, even if you're not streaming. It will create an MP4 file recording of your audio and video using the stream's bitrate settings. And if you want an additional copy of just the audio, you can create a WAV file recording in addition to the MP4. This is helpful if you're streaming a podcast and want an audio-only version for upload. Once you're ready to stream and record, simply press the Stream Record User button and tap On Air. You can connect up to 12 PTZ cameras to the VR120HD and control them using the menus. If you plan to use this feature a lot, reassign one of the user buttons by pressing Setup and choose the button that will open Camera Control Mode. Next, tap the Setup button. You can still use the Camera Control menu to set up cameras and store and recall presets, but the Setup menu makes it easier to configure and use cameras. To set up a camera, choose the protocol for your camera's brand. If your camera is from Sony or it's not on the list, use Visco over IP. Next, enter the IP address of your camera. This is where it can be helpful to use static IP addresses with an unmanaged network switch. If using a router with a DHCP server, you should reserve the IP addresses in your router settings so that the cameras keep the same IP address every time you turn everything on. Once connected, you can pan, tilt, and zoom the camera, as well as store and recall presets. You can also recall a specific preset for all connected cameras, if you want to recall different presets from different cameras, create a macro that runs the recalls that you need. Footswitch control is a creative way to upgrade your workflow. Using foot switches and expression pedals from Roland's boss line, you can control just about anything without using your hands. For this overview, we will focus on the foot switches and show you how to set up the boss FS6. Using a quarter inch balanced TRS cable, connect the compatible foot switch to the back of the VR120HD and open the CTL EXP menu. Set the type to CTL for foot switches and EXP for expression pedals. 
The FS6 and FS7 have two buttons, so they'll use both CTL-A and B. Note that the FS5U will not control CTL-A. Because it only has one button, it uses CTL-B. Next, you need to choose a category of commands. You can do things like recall a scene or macro, output a still image, or remotely press a button like auto or picture in picture. Now when I press the foot switch, it's just like pressing the cut button. There are some additional features and settings in the system menu worth mentioning. Panel lock can disable specific buttons and knobs on the VR120HD, which is perfect for preventing accidental button presses. For example, if you only use input buttons 1 through 6, you can disable the buttons for 7 and 8, which reduces the risk of switching to an empty input. And if you end up needing those buttons later and forgot that you locked them, the menu button will flash when you try to use it, indicating that panel lock is enabled. There are additional settings in the system menu to customize the multi-view text and icons, output test signals, and reset all your settings to their default. More information is available in the reference manual. To update the firmware on your VR120HD, go to proev.roland.com, click on Streaming Switchers under Products, choose the VR120HD, and scroll down a bit until you see Downloads. On the list, click on System Program, also known as Firmware. This page contains detailed information on every update, as well as steps on how to update, with the download button at the bottom. A 16 GB or less USB flash drive is recommended for the update. Connect it to the front of the VR120HD and format it in the USB memory menu, if you have not already. Once the update is downloaded, unzip the update file and copy it to your USB flash drive. Make sure that the file is not in a folder on the USB flash drive. It needs to be in the main directory. Power off the VR120HD, connect the USB flash drive, and hold Picture-in-Picture -Picture 2 program, DSK1 program, and DSK2 program while you power it on again and wait for it to load the update menu. On the LCD screen, it will ask you to press enter with the value knob. When finished, the LCD screen will display complete. Please restart. Power the VR120HD off and back on again. Note that the first time you turn it on after an update, it may take a bit longer to load. That concludes this complete tutorial on the VR120HD. We hope this video was helpful and showed you some new things to try. If you have any questions or need support, please visit roland.com backstage, register your VR120HD, and submit a support ticket. There are additional guides available on our website and knowledge base. The link to the VR120HD Quick Start Guide in the video description is a great place to start. Thank you for watching.